Okay, hello everybody. Um, welcome to the merge implementers call number four. Um, do you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Yes. Cool. It's been pretty silent here. Okay, so we have like regular updates for today and uh, a few discussions on top of that. Um, first item in the agenda is the Ryanism. And uh, we are currently running Nocturne DevNet, which has started yesterday. Um, it reached finality and uh, looks stable so far. Um, uh, there have been a few edge cases, which we saw on this um, DevNet. And also there is like an issue with deposits, uh, uh, with uh, in particular with if one deposit voting, but I guess we're near to solve this issue and we will see deposits um, like eight teams are running their validators um, and uh, uh, several community members um, are doing this as well and uh, they are like helping with uh, doing some testing on it depositing uh, trying to break uh, trying to submit bad blocks and so forth so that's great um, and yeah um, I have like a couple of questions regarding the Nocturne DevNet. Um, we've been planning to test um, transaction propagation there. Um, is anybody from Go Ethereum team on the call now? So I believe it's a holiday in Germany. So most oh. of the team will be offline. Okay, uh, probably Proto, you, you might know um, if uh, this PR is about to get merged or already merged, I don't know, which enables the I transaction think... propagation. Oh, well, I think there's this one PR by Gary that improves on some of the things, but I'm not sure about transaction propagation. The testnet will run for a few more days at least, so we can try it later. Yeah, okay, um, yeah, makes sense. Yeah, the other question was about like state sync, but yeah, I, I guess that was mostly addressed to go with your own team again. So let's just skip it. Um, yeah, if anybody wants to join Nocturne, you are free to, you're welcome to do this. Um, I'll just drop, yeah, you may reach out Proto or uh, just uh, drop a message in the Ryanism Discord channel um, and request for some ETH to get deposited. Yeah, but we need first two deposits to, to, to be, this deposit issue to be resolved. Okay, so here is the relay link for Nocturne. Uh, Proto, do you want to add anything about Nocturne? Well, about Ryanism in general, maybe. I think yeah, that's that like out. the next. Yep. Okay. Sorry, no, yeah, no. that's like the next. We'll start time. about talk about this then. Yeah, yeah. So you may just start it right away. Right. So with Rayanism, I think that we should basically wrap up the hackathon kind of phase and think of the merge more like this thing that we are going to work towards with production, and this basically means that we want to do the rebase which I'd like to call it. If you're playing with Git terminology, you have Altair in London first. This is this missing functionality which has been developed in parallel. But now it's time to try and like layer the merge work on top of these updates and then implement the new API. So we move away from JSON RPC. I'd like to I'd like to move away from that. It's up for discussion. And then um from there, we have a better chance of a client that can do the fork transitions well, and we can write less code that we have to throw away later. So we can work on state sync and these more difficult problems and uh, make some progress there. And just some, some context on uh, consensus side on, on Altair is that we do have a pre-release, another pre-release coming today and uh, a target for a freeze on that a week from tomorrow so that 
after that, we would begin to rebase the, mer the merge spec on Altair uh, because we'll also be seeing spec conformant um, Altair releases soon after that on the, the client side. So that sounds sounds great. Um, so like the rough plan is to wrap up Ryanism, right? And then um, um, like while client implementers uh, are focused on um, Altair and London, we'll keep doing some uh, spec and research work, like figuring out the transition process. We'll do some proof of concepts um, on top of the infrastructure that we get um, out of Ryanism. Uh, thanks a lot to Proto for doing a tremendous amount of work on it. And uh, yeah, then we are uh, getting back after probably Altair and uh, London uh, is uh, like nearer to get finished. Uh, we get back and like spawn another merge testnet, uh, hopefully with uh, state sync, uh, with the new consensus API which is going to be discussed as well and uh, spec'd out during this period of time. So it's like a, a month or two. Um, so that's my understanding. And I, I think, yeah, that this kind of plan makes a lot of sense, sense to me. Yeah, I think we'll also extend the consensus test vectors to the merge as well, which there's like a lot of work in that direction right now in the spec repo and it will certainly be ready for kind of the next wave of this development yeah, yeah definitely um also uh, it's been planned to deploy the withdrawals devnet and uh, to work on charging during ranism um this work will will keep going uh, in post ranism so it's not like abandoned and hopefully we'll like have a yeah, as I already said, we have uh, um, all resources uh, like infrastructure, block explorer, scripts, dockers, uh, just to spawn uh, dev nets and test nets easily. Anything else regarding reason? I want to echo what Mikhail said. Uh, huge props to Proto really in the effort and for all the contributors and stuff. It's really awesome to see the DevNet up. Yeah, we'll like really have uh, seven clients implemented the initial merge stack, which is amazing result. Um, which client is missing? Um, yeah, Open Ethereum is missing. Yeah, and uh, I guess TurboGath is also um, has also missed this one. But they can like um, catch up with the changes from Go Ethereum. But I don't know whether it's possible or not. Um, the question from Micah. I don't know how to answer on it. Uh, Will the open will open room be able to make the merge? If no one here knows the answer, that's fine. <laughs> I'm just curious if someone had any clues. I think they're still thinking through it. I don't want to speak on their behalf. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Probably just somebody heard something and which makes sense to share here. But anyway, if not, let's skip this. Okay, so I guess that's all for Anism. Um, and we are moving to research updates. Um, yeah, one update from my side, I've been supposed to start work on the transition process, but unfortunately I had not uh, have enough time to do this. Um, to 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 come to some you know readable spec or this kind of stuff for analysis that um, that I was supposed to do that I was planned to do, uh, but yeah I guess we'll start the next week. Uh, was actually a bit busy with the Ryanism and 
other stuff. Um, any other research updates? Um, and Nikhil, this is primarily to um, change the transition portion to be a dynamic total difficulty based off of fork. Yeah, yeah, that's that's it. Uh, I was like going to analyze uh, the um, way how difficult it could be changed throughout the voting period and what uh, right. value would make sense to to how. Uh, what, what would be the right way to extrapolate the total difficulty that we could expect? Gotcha. Be Let yeah, me because... know when you open that up, I can give you a hand. Yeah, sure. Be because, uh, yeah, it, it, it's reasonable to use the um, if one data voting for to, to get the block hash, mm -hmm. which we will use for extrapolation uh, because yeah, otherwise we would need to come to consensus on this uh, block hash first, which is, which does not make much sense, but we'll see. Yeah, yeah, I, I my gut is to use the first ETH1 data voting block after the beacon chain fork, um, but as the function of total difficulty, um, rather than using something stale, but we can chat about it. Yeah. Okay, other research updates. Withdrawals, maybe. Uh, yeah, I could say a few words. Uh, I got good feedback uh, from the last call. Thanks for it. And made some improvements. Uh, edit partial uh, withdrawals uh, section. It looks viable, but it will be restricted to validators with BLS withdrawal credentials. So it's very limited for usage in shared pools. I think we cannot do something on chain in Ethereum 1 with it, but something like Shamir's secret uh, with BLS uh, could work in off-chain pools. Uh, you could check an updated doc with uh, rewards withdrawal section and provide me uh, some feedback on it. Uh, thank you. Here is the link. Will do. Thanks. Thanks, Dimitri. Anything else before we move on? Okay, cool. Uh, let's move to the spec discussion. And the first item is consensus API standard. I think it's a good time to open this um, can of worms. Uh, so we like and to start the discussion. Yeah, I'd like to just share my very um, off, off the top of my head uh, opinion on that. Um, so we like have JSON RPC. Yeah, the, the, this is the discussion about how the consensus API uh, will be provided by execution engines, uh, which um, underlying protocol we will use for that. Um, and uh, once we make a decision on this protocol, uh, we are free to design the particular endpoints and uh, move forward. So like the, what do we have so far is the JSON RPC API, which most of people here are familiar with, I guess. Um, and the other one is the ETH2 API, uh, the Beacon Node API. Uh, so JSON RPC is like um, based on the, yeah, it's HTTP um, as well, but yeah, ETH2 API is the REST API. Um, and uh, my opinion is that, um, the in general um, i lean i'm leaning toward the rest api um it's like convenient it has a lot of tools it can be secured and so forth um uh, but uh, uh the argument for using the json rpc is that it's been already implemented in all of the eth1 clients um and uh, we will just need to 
reuse the code. Uh, but one uh, thing that we should keep in mind here is that this new API uh, will need to be exposed on a separate uh, port um, and not exposed to the public um, for security reasons, because this is the tight relationship be between the consensus layer and the execution layer. Um, so I think that implementing this from scratch with like REST um, approach uh, makes sense uh, from this point as well uh, to avoid uh, like bugs and uh, in the implementation that will relate that will uh, abuse the uh, that will um, like damage the security anyhow. So um, yeah, let's just discuss it. Um, any any opinions that we should use JSON RPC for this consensus API. Lucas. We... I have a question. Uh, can you provide me with some more concrete examples of what we will gain if we will re-implement re it? Because just saying that there's tooling that's not really, doesn't really clear much. So if, we should focus on what it will bring us and then we will can decide, not before. Yeah, that's fair. Hey, Danny. Um, I am actually, I'm gonna pull up a, an old comment from Peter and Martin when we were debating as to the API between a beacon and validator. Um, and Peter jumped in and gave a long, Argument for using RESTful HTTP instead of JSON RPC, and regretted the choice uh, of JSON RPC on current ETH1 clients. And here it is. I won't go through it all here, uh, but if you are interested, take a look. I think that's so relevant when making these types of decisions. Obviously, I think uh, certainly what Lucas kind of implied is that the, the uh, one of the main drawbacks of changing this kind of thing is adding support for another API type on clients that already serve JSON. Uh, you said just just now you said RESTful HTTP. Did you mean that, or is that a misspeak? Do you, are we talking specifically about HTTP, which means WebSockets are out, or is REST over WebSocket considered still part of REST in this case? Are still on the table. Well, I mean, REST is a design pattern, right? And HTTP right, is yeah, a yeah. transfer. Yeah. You said RESTful HTTP. Like, so the reason I'm asking is because, like, I'm a big fan of REST, but um, I'm also a big fan of WebSockets. And especially for, like, a long, what's essentially going to be a long-lived connection like this, WebSockets make more sense, in my opinion. And so REST over WebSocket, um, I would be like a huge advocate for, uh, where I'd be much weaker advocate for doing all the work to do REST over HTTP or doing both, you know, REST over HTTP or WebSocket, like we do with JSON RPC, would be fine too. I will not make a response because I don't have enough of an opinion here. Okay. Uh, Micah, could you elaborate on why WebSockets make uh, much sense in this context? Um, because, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, um, and maybe I am here, uh, but the there will be a reasonable amount of traffic over this channel, and we want to make sure that we're not um, getting inundated by just HTTP overhead. Uh, with WebSocket, you spin up the WebSocket once at the beginning of the connection, and you just leave it open, and the overhead per message is very, very low compared to HTTP. Whereas with HTTP, oftentimes you end up with more overhead from HTTP headers than you do for the actual payload. Yeah, we have like the validator clients that are currently working uh, over HTTP. I, I believe you might be overestimating the amount of communication and overhead there. Uh, not from the, the also, protocols themselves, but just that the amount of requests that have to be sent and the payloads there are actually probably pretty small. Yeah, you know, you're sending requests like what are we talking? Like we were talking every few blocks, seconds, right? So. Yeah. yeah. Like, I mean, this it doesn't feel like. The, the header should be large compared to like say at least one block. 
So what I would actually vote for HTTP because like it's just so convenient that you can do things like just curl or request and stuff like that. And like any any other API tends to like have like much stronger blockers if you just want to experiment and do some quick stuff. Uh, then Krat, you meant you're um, on the like REST side. I mean, you're in support of REST because JSON RPC is also. Um, yeah, I'm in support of HTTP REST, yeah. Okay. That's what I mean. Lucas? If we want to do REST and we want to do WebSockets together, then we can have to emulate some parts of the REST in WebSockets, like things like getting things from the path. We need to somehow code it, encode it, etc. Because REST is was designed mostly as an HTTP API, if I'm correct. Yes, and Mike, sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm going to back down WebSockets if there's um, if there's not much throughput. I, I'm I am not surprised if I'm overestimating the volume of traffic here. Do we have an idea on the? So one of the arguments for JSON RPC is that it allows clients to reuse code because they speci they specifically will need to be opening a server on a different port. Um, does that change how much code they're able to reuse? Like, do we know our clients designed in a way that they can very like it's easier to spin up another copy of the same type of server again within their client, or would it be just as easy to just spin up a different type of server? Paul? Oh, yeah. So I wasn't trying to respond to that question. I put my hand up before. Um, I could try and respond to that, though. I would guess that um, making a HTTP API is, is probably trivial for... I'd say all languages involved. Um, so I, I wouldn't I wouldn't imagine it would be that much that much work. But I'll I'll wait for other people to answer before I, I change to a different topic. So if I can answer uh, Micah's question, uh, it's very easy for us in Nethermind to spin up a second port. We're already doing it for WebSockets communication. So just add another one. Would it be significantly easier for Nethermind to spin up another JSON RPC server or just as easy to spin up a REST server within another mind? It will be a bit easier to spin up just a second uh, second port. Uh, I don't think that doing a REST uh, would be that hard. But in REST, you have uh, you should, for example, correctly use um, HTTP codes for communication. Yeah, that's part of REST. Right, so a little bit, a little bit like carefully designing the responses, etc., error responses, which are more or less defined in the JSON RPC already. Um, okay, Paul, do you want to share any other opinion? Yeah, so what I, my understanding is that one of the things we have yet to figure out with the, the communications between the consensus and execution clients is how do we deal with them syncing between each other? For instance, if you like, if your consensus client is long running and then you say wipe the DB of your execution client, how do we get them to sync with each other again? Um, has this has this been like fleshed out somewhere because um, it seems like it might be um an, an important factor is in determining the, the the communications that we use um and i'm especially interested because i know that sometimes rest can be um i think it's great for this reason but it can be um restrictive at times and i'm i need to think it through but i'm not sure if we'd start to run into problems with rest if we're trying to sync these two processes between each other, whether we'd, we'd start inferring state between requests and break rest. Um, so I guess my primary question is, have, have we looked at how they're going to sync together? And I've just missed that off. Um, I don't think that rest will give much more, uh, more overhead in this case, in case of sync than the regular JSON RPC. But I don't know. Is, That's just my opinion. 
is the connection between the two stateful at all? Or like, could you have three execution clients on the, hypothetically, have three execution clients on the back end talking to one um, uh, consensus client and everything would be fine? Or is there like an assumed state? Um, it's stateful because like the, it depends of course on the design of the execution client or the execution engine. Um, like if we have like three servers that uh, uh, that are in front of the execution engine core, which processes blocks, um, this is one design. And uh, if we like have the monolith architecture as we have it today. So um, yeah, there is a one, one to one relationship or one uh, or many to one, uh, many beacon nodes to one execution engine. But not the opposite. But how is it? Uh, it? It doesn't need to be stateful. I mean, the only state would be whether the execution node has actually received the block, right? But once it has it, like, I think that should um, be the only state. Execution engines rely on a notion of the current head for a lot of things. Um, that could be changed, uh, and you could just like kind of have a representation. Rep uh, more dynamic representation of, of the block tree and multiple different potential heads, but they today rely on like, when you set the head, there's certain things that are like optimized in terms of what state is available and, and which pending blocks are being created and that kind of stuff. Is it possible okay, to design that away? It'd be really nice if this could be a stateful or stateless connection. Like, can we make it so when the a uh, consensus client makes a request of the execution engine, it gives the execution engine at that point in time all the state it needs to answer that correctly. I mean, you certainly can. And I think the, the so inserting block has the state that it needs. You know, I mean, you, you either have the previous block or not. And um, assemble block, I think right now tells it the head you want to assemble on. Uh, and so the information again is there, but there's still like certainly likely some optimizations and reuse of how these things work today that set head becomes really useful. Um, set head, but you can, you can certainly kind of design an execution engine that doesn't really care about set head and uh, the other methods I think would work fine, um, but it doesn't reuse existing code quite the same. Okay, so if if a um, consensus client asks a execution client to build me a block, um, it will tell it enough information that it will either get a correct block or it will get back an error saying, I can't build that because I don't know about this head you're talking about, um, but it won't give back an incorrect block, right? Like it has enough information to make sure that to validate that it's giving back the right block. Yeah, right. And uh, when you were like uh, saying that, like suppose there are three execution engines um, and there is one consensus uh, um, client in front of them. And yet in order to get, to stay in sync, in order to maintain the state uh, and to maintain the full state and the execution chain, um, this uh, consensus client will have to feed all three with the new box and uh, with the, any other information required to get sync and stay uh, synced. Gotcha, so it'd have to essentially, whatever you have routing there would have to do a broadcast. So it receives a um, you know, new, block, new set head from the consensus client, and then it would broadcast that down to all of its connected execution clients, hypothetically. So that way they all update themselves, right? Yeah, like set head, uh, new block. I think else. one of the things Paul is concerned about is, for example, if uh, consensus says insert block and the execution engine doesn't actually have the parent in there, you know, what is the communication protocol to recover from that? Uh, does the consensus just walk backwards until parents until the execution engine has what it, it's supposed to have and then inserts from there? Or is there some other more dynamic recovery? Um, that I don't think we've quite worked. Through. And that's the kind of like, how are these two things in sync? Um, you know, what happens if one 
shuts down and then you it comes back up and doesn't have a database like that kind of stuff we haven't worked through that and i think to answer your question paul we haven't worked through it <laughs> um yeah actually before uh, the assemble block with the, some parent hash is sent uh, we have this new block um with the, this parent hash right so if it's it was not the case uh, then um, yeah there is inconsistency between uh, the beacon chain and the execution chain. Uh, if we are talking about like uh, one consensus engine and uh, one, one execution engine, um, if this is like the infrastructure where you, you have like multiple beacon, beacon clients, beacon chain clients using like uh, a few um, execution engines uh, or something like that, yeah, probably that could be the case. So. Yeah, it, it seems to me that um, like a, a test would be if you have, say, one um, consensus client and then you had a proxy and then, say, three execution clients behind that proxy, um, that wouldn't really make sense because you like, you know, the that walking back process procedure that Danny was talking about would just doesn't doesn't make sense if you start bouncing off random um, executions clients based on the proxy. So it gives me the idea that maybe REST isn't the best thing that we're chasing for. I mean, naturally I, I'm, I would prefer to REST just because it's a, it's a like over a JSON RPC, just because I, because I prefer that, but this just kind of feels to me a little bit more like an, an RPC, like a one-to-one -one RPC. Yeah, I get it. What I don't really like about JSON RPC is that it's uh, custom error codes, custom error messages, but um, as it's been said, uh, we're all familiar with that. And uh, uh, one thing worth considering here is that all e E2 clients currently support JSON RPC and have a JSON RPC client to fetch deposits and to get it one data uh, for the rewards. So uh, we don't have an overhead in like implementing this JSON RPC client either. If the, yeah. um, sorry, go ahead. Thanks. I was just going to say that um, the current design of having, you know, these two separate processes, consensus and execution processes, I think is the way that we're going for now, just because it, it kind of makes sense. But um, a world where they're, they're wrapped in the one process, um, not necessarily maintained by the same team, but they present as a single binary um, seems appealing to me. Um, and perhaps using something like JSON RPC is nice because we could start to use like a IPC um, socket as a comms transfer between them. And if we're doing something like, instead of having two processes, we're importing them as a binary, then um, that works very well for them to talk between each other. Um, whereas like having a HTTP client, and HTTP server between these two, like inside the same processes is a little odd as well. Uh, by, my, by binary, you mean the binary protocol? So I mean binaries in like, um, like, you know, something dot exe in Windows kind of thing. Okay. Correct me if I'm wrong, but um, let's say the consensus client says, hey, assemble me a block with this parent and the execution client doesn't have that parent. Um, is it correct that the execution client then goes to its own gossip network to get that block? It doesn't talk back to the consensus client. Is that correct? It's still one way communication or request um, response rather. Um, there are two options to respond back with error and which will be like the, uh, like a database and consistency error um, because these uh, two parts are actually one client and uh, their um, data should be consistent. Uh, the other option is yes, to try to go to and download and pull this block from not from gossip, but from the block. Um, yeah, from ETH uh, protocol, network protocol, and to get those blocks. But yeah, I guess uh, what, what was uh, I kept in mind is what like it's just responded with error. So there is no such parent block. So I thought we're not like responding to the ETH request anymore. Didn't we cut that part of the gossip out or cut that part of the protocol out? 
Sorry, could you repeat the question? Can you, can you still request a block <clears throat> through ETH or did we cut that out as part of the networking to make the execution engine kind of more silent? Uh, no, we don't cut this out. We just uh, we cut out the block gossip. Got it. It's not cut out because of how uh, initial sync, especially state sync, might be performed. Uh, it can still be utilized. And there's certainly an interesting design decision here. If there is some sort of like, if the execution engine detects some sort of inconsistency inconsist because it's being requests are being made for things that it doesn't know about, it it can use that endpoint to go and fill fill you know the unknown things in. So it, it can use the P2P network to get back into consistency with the consensus uh, node, which is interesting it probably works out of the box but it's also kind of a strange uh design decision I, I like it because it makes it so the so basically the the flow here would be the consensus engine says hey do this thing for me execution engine says i can't do that and then it basically goes and fixes itself on its own like it's a, essentially a self-healing system and so if you had like an edge server or proxy server between the two you could notice that oh we got a consistency area take that execution engine out of rotation because it's down for a bit and then we'll try it again later. And meanwhile, it can then fall back to a backup execution engine or just remove it. It's got three in rotation. Now it's only got two in rotation or something. And so the whole system ends up being fairly self-healing if the execution engines can heal themselves when they get a request that indicates they're out of sync. Right. I mean, I, I kind of like it as well. I mean, there's it also just gets to leverage exactly what the execution engine does today to heal itself. If it finds, learns about things yeah. it doesn't know about, but it can still, especially on the one-to-one -one communication, it can kind of complicate things. Like if you get, uh, if you talk to an execution engine locally and it, it doesn't know something, then you just kind of sit there and wait and hope that it knows about it in the future, uh, because it's pres presumably helps self-healing itself, and the consensus can't really be as proactive that it as it might want to be. Mm, I see, because it would just basically have to just pull it since it's a one-way communication channel until it gets back a success. Right. Yeah, the case we're discussing yeah, now is... Um, yeah, in, if there is no, like, um, like if consensus client asks for assembling a block on top some, of some um, parent that is not known for that is not like presented in the execution chain, it would mean that um, the consensus client before, while uh, uh, important a parent of this block uh, got failed or something bad happened. Because if the execution engine response was like, this block is valid, then uh, we assume that uh, it's been inserted in, the, in its uh, database and in its chain. So I would say that this is like, um, like some, weird and odd uh, case rather than something yeah, that should be usual. Uh, I think the, re the reason I keep harping on this um, one to many is because I think pragmatic, I suspect pragmatically what we're going to see is that we're going to see a bunch of people running validator clients and very few and leaning on third party providers for the execution client because the execution client is so expensive to run. Like I, I run a few and they are not cheap and they're not easy. Like it's you. You basically have to run uh, oper an operation center to run an ETH one client or an execution client right now, and that isn't going to change in the immediate future. Like we're working on that, but that's a ways off. And so I think realistically, we probably will see people going to places like Infura and QuickNode and all these and Alchemy for their execution client, and they run their own um, consensus client. And in that scenario, we do have exactly this, where you've got you you hit some proxy server, and the proxy server is going to route you to one of a hundred execution clients. And so I, I suspect that's going to be, at least for the time being, that's going to be the, the common scenario, um, not the uncommon one like we would like. Which is unfortunate, but I think the reality, I suspect I mean, the reality. I think an operation, operation center has been exaggerated. I, mean, um, I agree, it's, like it's, it's, it's a big problem. It's like 10x more than in these two times. Um, but also as a comment, like uh, from the research perspective, we are thinking about how to change that, like using a tool of custody, where we do make it necessary for people to run their own execution plans. Like we want to make it really hard to do exactly what you described. 
like the outsourcing to Endura kind of scenario. So like we will actively break that uh, pattern. Just mentioning that uh, we at Nimbus have users that run both get and Nimbus on a Raspberry Pi. I've heard rumor of such such people. <laughs> I don't know how they do it. I've got like a a server that I rent that I struggle to keep on. Yeah, we 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 struggle to keep Gath up on like a you know box with eight gig and and four cores, um, and then sometimes it runs fine. Yeah, get so perhaps to... the. Uh, just, just real quick, perhaps the, the, the right question is, is we should, if everybody is in agreement that we are going to brick people that are not running both execution and um, consensus client, then yes, I think we can kind of design towards the one-to-one -one connection and focus on that, making that good and smooth. Uh, if we think that at least for, for the time being, there, we, we're going to allow for and enable people to do like use Alchemy and Infura, then I think we should design for that uh, because I do think that's going to be more common. So maybe the first question is, is which one are we actually designing for? Well, and there's two types of there's, there's validators. Uh, sorry, I'm getting a lot of feedback. There's validators, which uh, there's, a, there's an explicit desire to um, put a proof of custody on execution so that it's non outsourceable. But for users in general, there uh, there's all sorts of uh, design considerations, you know, running a beacon chain and and getting proofs about state uh, execution layer state, or running a light beacon chain and not running execution at all, and or you know a much different, many different versions of that. So th there's not just the validator that we're designing for here. Gotcha. Also, maybe to add, maybe to add um, that uh, also. The one-to-one -one design might include things like secret shared validators and stuff like that. We should also consider that because it might make sense, for example, to run a secret shared validators where you have uh, four separate beacon nodes, but only one execution node. Uh, designs like that uh, may be possible. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily say that just because we don't want Impura, that means we should optimize for one-to-one. -one. Yeah. Is, it, is there? Another, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, if if we do look at um, one to many, do we have this? So the idea that you know, if a, if a consensus um, client requests a block from the execution client and the execution client doesn't know the parent, and it goes and tries to find the block itself, don't we have the problem that the execution client can't rely on blocks being valid unless it can verify them with the consensus client? Um, right. And you might say that, okay, so then if it gets a request for a block, then it should assume that it's canonical, but then that kind of breaks when you get to Infura, when you, you, you'll you just have people spraying anything at it. Wait, um, wait validity so like is independent, independent of consensus. Yeah. Validity yeah. is that was, of consensus. Right, so, oh, so you, you could, anyone could tell it to follow a, a, an execution chain and that would be, and it could be valid with respect to execution parameters, you know, the EVM transition exactly. is correct. But the consensus, any any consensus kind of outer layer on top of that is not gonna pick that chain if there weren't a valid uh, set of transactions. I mean, a valid set of- uh, wouldn't, wouldn't that be a DOS right. then though? I could just fill up an execution- Absolutely. If you open it up, if you open it up to like, if you, if Infura opens it up to anyone being able to trigger whatever, I mean, I think that that's certainly a DOS vector. Yeah, and that's what I was going to say, uh, that it must be a consensus block first. Um, it can't self-heal from just getting the execution block hash. It can if it's a trusted relationship. I mean, I, I, the idea of consensus running, uh, I'm sorry, of Infura running uh, execution layer clients and not having any view into like the consensus layer. Uh, I mean, I think that they, you would need to like, they would need to design their own trust model here um, on, on these endpoints. I, I don't think that you can open up any of this stuff to arbitrary requests regardless. Okay. Um, so getting back to 
JSON RPC versus REST API. Anything, any arguments against or um, against JSON RPC? Does anybody have anything to add here? Um, uh, my, my feeling is that we're, we're not quite at that question yet, that we still don't understand the the nature of the the communications between the two the two items and that I think when Mika went down the role of like talking about one to one or one to many that's probably what we want to what we need to be thinking about in abstract terms before we start to pick protocols but, but perhaps I'm missing something yeah I, I would tend to agree that these one to one, one to many, many to many type of questions, and the staying in sync question need to be poked on at least for a week or two uh, to even see if like the current communication protocol is sufficient, and then if if it is or is not, uh, that that might tell us what we want to do here. I mean, my my gut, I, I have a, a slight preference for RESTful HTTP, but based off of what I currently know, but I think that there's some unknown. Yeah, well, if, if I could, if I could choose how it ends up, way. I'd say, okay. yeah, I was just gonna say, if I, if, I, if I was to choose how it ends up, I'd love to see it to be like one to many RESTful HTTP, because I think that's super flexible. That'd be, that'd be nice to aim for, I reckon. Proto, you had um, a slight preference for RESTful HTTP because of the authentication model. Is that something you want to share before we move on? Well, so I think separation is really important of the two different RPCs. And this is for security as well as just stability. I think in the current design, there's a lot of assumptions on the EVE1 connection, on the existing EVE1 connection. Um, for the deposit data fetching and sync. And um, in this testnet, it's really been a struggle mostly to work around these assumptions to make it stable. And I think just starting with a fresh connection that's focused on consensus, isolated and secured is just a much, much better approach. Okay. If I understand correctly, are you basically arguing that by using a different protocol, we kind of guarantee that we're not going to have clients with bugs that cause bleed between the two? Yeah, so within the JSON RPC, there, like it, the protocol itself is fine. It's the client that exposes it and the client that fetches from it that have these existing assumptions around it for deposit data sync. And at the same time, we mix it up with the previous existing code. And I think that is just like, it, you we just increase the, the surface for bugs in the consensus API. So Proto, are you kind of making an something? argument for dedicated deposit endpoints on execution clients? So honestly, I think that's a better idea as well. We have seen various I also like. bugs uh, in receipt logs and whatnot. And it, if they break something that's critical, then yeah, like it, it wouldn't yeah, be, a lot of I wouldn't mind a separate school. Lucas, do you want to add something? Uh, so a little bit on the side, uh, because we are, I heard some talk about uh, one too many client um, connections. Is that, is that right? Oh, it's okay. Uh, we were even thinking about making it uh, many too many. So uh, arbitrary number of clients could talk to one uh, Ethereum, to, Ethereum one node and vice versa. Uh, so uh we were also but this would be uh, this would need some additional work on our side to enable that and we would have to differentiate the clients and keep some state for them uh some block tree uh, info about the current state and some transaction pool uh need 
need to be separate, uh, but the rest could be probably shared. That might be a good way to like reduce uh, resource usage because if each Ethereum two validator node would require an Ethereum one node, that might be quite a big uh, requirement. If we can share each Ethereum one node for like 10 or 100 Ethereum 2 nodes that would make it a less of a pain and easier for like providers of that um, of that uh, infrastructure, for example. Okay, unless there are any other arguments, I think we should wrap up. And uh, yeah, we're already using JSON RPC for a consensus API. And we'll keep doing this for the proof of concept and for development phase. Um, yeah, that being said, it's yet to figure out uh, what are the requirements for this uh, communication protocol uh, with regard to the sync process. So we'll see, we'll see more um, inputs to this question and get back to it later on. Okay. Yeah, anything else here? Okay, cool. Let's move to the next one. Okay, spec discussions, execution. Um, uh, first of all, uh, we met some interesting edge case uh, with the, the catalyst on the Nocturne devnet. Um, that was a kind of, uh, yeah. Okay. So the, the, the case is the following, uh, like, um, suppose we have a block, uh, and we have like two children of this block. Um, and, uh, these boss children, um, have, uh, the same state root, which is legal because we don't have, uh, minor rewards anymore. And, uh, these two blocks can have, uh, empty transaction lists. And what uh, catalyst does, it uh, rejects uh, the second block it observes. Uh, with the error, uh, like, um, yeah, this, and this uh, mechanism is a part of the mechanism that protects from state mirroring attacks. Um, I guess nobody from Go Ethereum here um, to discuss this uh, particular behavior. Um, but yeah, probably Proto can add uh, anything here. So the state mirroring attack really only applies to like long range attacks, I think. Um, so beyond like more than a hundred or so blocks. Um, in the test net, when there are not that many transactions, it's very common to have the same state root and rewards are issued in the consensus protocol and not in the execution protocol. So you'll end up with the exact same state and maybe we should redesign this so that we have a unique state root per block and this would be a change on the ethereum one side um, yeah i have like a related question does any any uh, other uh, econ clients has a uh, problem with the or has issues or has some protection against um, having this kind of uh, two blocks with the same state root. Is this a problem? So there's a warning coming from guests, but is it actually hurt the functionality currently? So and when it inserts a side chain and, re and reorganizes uh, the blocks, then it will abort. Yeah, just reject the block, right? So at least for basically we need to, uh, it's on my to-do list to read Martin's write up and see how it affects us. So we don't know, I don't know what the behavior is right now. Okay. I mean, essentially if the, if the, uh, the consensus side tries to insert what the execution sees as a block it already has and it just returns and say it returned and said like, okay, I, I have that already. Um, then, and you point it, then you did a set head, assuming that method exists. Um, would there be much issue here? Because essentially, I, I, I suppose 
two different, I mean, we talked about this a little bit, but like two different beacon chain forks could point to the same underlying execution layer chain. And that both of them, essentially, if you reorg from this to that, you'd say set head and it'd point to the same place and the execution layer probably doesn't care. I think there's probably just some like minor things to work through here, but I don't, I don't suspect that we would need to enforce that every beacon chain execution layer root has is unique across forks. Um, obviously, you could do that by like inserting. So the problem why we protect against this attack is to optimize the way we sync these execution payloads in the Ethereum one client. So if you can trust the state root, then you can basically uh, skip ahead. And when right. there's this kind of long range mirror attack, I don't, I'm not familiar with the details, then you may skip this validation. And so even though the state root is the same, the block contents could be different. And then you could get into this dangerous uh, kind of uh, sync scenario. Um, what do you mean by the block contents being different? So if you optimize to trust the state root, mm -hmm. then you can get this kind of problem where if you reorganize and then accept the state root because it's the same, then your block contents may not be validated correctly. Uh, I have a question. Uh, we are talking about the mirrored state attacks, yeah? Yes. Uh, so I think it's related to pruning. Right. And we will prune on when we were on the finalize uh, block from Ethereum to consensus in Ethereum one execution engine, because before that yeah. we cannot really prune. Yeah. Yeah, I agree, Lucas, with your uh, with you on that. Also, I think that uh, this is not related to uh, all uh, potential and. Prune, state try pruning implementations. This, this is, uh, I might be wrong here. Um, it, it probably better to ask Go Ethereum, but from what I understand, um, it's related to how the, how Geth uh, does uh, state try pruning. And uh, yeah, this kind of attack is specific to Geth. Hmm. And uh, to this particular pruning algorithm, when, do, when they have like this um, side chain, which is not executed, before it reaches a uh, greater total difficulty than the canonical chain. And then they switch to the side chain and if there is uh, like a, a gap, um, so they can't uh, retrieve the state because it's been pruned. Uh, they trust uh, like this portion of chain they can't execute. That's, and that's where the state mirroring appears. Yeah, so is it based on reorganizations? Um, yeah, and reorganizations and because of pruning. Yeah, so That's if right. we don't prune as the thing before we the block gets finalized, we don't have this issue really. Yeah, right. So I don't think we need to uh, make state root unique for each block uh, in the context of uh, executing um, and the context of uh, execution on the beacon chain. Mm -hmm. But this this is just uh, this uh, like edge case appeared in the Nocturne DevNet as uh, a signal to to, to consider um, this uh, state root um, being not unique for each block and yeah keep in mind for further um, design or like testing and so forth. So in Nevermind we support side chains when we expect sometimes the state root not to be uh different because uh, of low volume of traffic there so we are working fine with that generally did um Ra, you said that there was a write-up from martin on this yeah he uh posted it recently in the um in the private key base that ETH one devs have um okay. yeah i gotta read that I think it's ultimately just a link to a 
to a GitHub gist. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so anything else on the execution side? Anything that uh, if one implementers would like to ask or discuss here? Okay, cool. So the next step is consensus discussions. I don't think that much um, that there is much to discuss here, but just in case. Does anybody want to discuss anything or ask a question? Okay, cool. Um, so let's go to the open discussions and there has been a proposal to move this goal uh, to the like to the same day uh, when it to implement our goal is happening. Just move, just make it, but uh, for the same time slot. So it will be like one hour of uh, merge implementer goal and then the it to implement our goal. Just wondering what do people think about it? Yeah, and probably Paul, uh, Paul raised this question and probably Paul has can would like to share his opinion. Yeah, sure. Thanks for raising it, Mikhail. Um, yeah, it was just my suggestion. Um, these, these, this call is 11 p.m. now um, and then midnight when daylight savings is on. Um, and they're, they're pretty disruptive um, to sleep schedules. So stacking them together um, is appealing to me. I'm not sure if anyone has reasons why that's not a good idea, perhaps. I think also meeting fragmentation is also something that I'm interested in. I like to pack my meetings together. Um, yeah. Yeah, I just wonder if we can see it for two and a half hours. Um, like if we have a lot to discuss with the merge and uh, with regard to other two stuff. I'm yeah, okay trying it out. Uh, I, the, yeah, the, one, the one problem I see is like, call exhaustion an hour or two. Uh, but the E2 calls are like fairly light usually. I think that might change a little bit as we're moving towards Altair production. Uh, but those calls are often even only 30 or 40 minutes. Any objections from trying it out and see how it goes? Um, okay, so let's just try. Um, so we have like two implementers goal next week. I guess we might try the uh, new time for the merge goal the like three weeks after today, right? I think that's good. A little bit of extra time now that Rainism's died down and there's a lot of like work on Altair in London that'll happen. That's that's a fine break. Yep. Thanks for uh, the kind consideration, everyone. It really means more than you think. I have a guest room. You can just move in in Colorado. Time zones are pretty good over here. Yeah, I'll ask my yeah. government if I'm allowed to leave. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess you probably can't even get into this country. I've lived in the US. Don't believe anyone who tells you their time zones or anything near sane. Oh, it's great. We wake, I wake, I have calls at six in the morning. It's wonderful. Yeah. They're sometimes, not in the night. Yeah, sometimes they're seven. <laughs> okay, any closing remarks? <laughs> okay, thanks everyone. Thanks for. Uh, this great month uh, of Ryanism work that I've been uh, lucky to be a part of. Um, see you in three weeks. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank Thanks, Miguel. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. You. Thanks.